one of the main reasons why people are noticing a lot of these types of symptoms where they have cognitive decline, uh, low energy, fatigue, um, you know, they, they just don't have that same get up and go. That has to do with the fact that their mitochondria are shrinking, their, their energy capacity is reducing, and uh, ultimately, they haven't been stressed enough and adapted enough to stress. And so therefore, uh, they're, they're noticing all of these different types of symptoms. And so what are some of the, let's talk about like some of the main, the best ways to stress them appropriately and adapt effectively so we can optimize mitochondrial health. Yeah. So one of the big misconceptions around hormetic stress is, you know, it's often talked about as a, uh, as a sort of a little bit of poison is good for you. And this is largely not correct in many, many cases. A better way of describing it is that biologically appropriate and compatible stressors, specific types of stress that are not novel for the human species, but are ancestral stressors, are extraordinarily beneficial for our body. And not only are they not stressful to our body in the sense that we all have this negative connotation with this word stress, mm. they are helpful for the body. Not only are they beneficial, they are actually required nutrients. In the same way that we require nutrients in our diet, they are required nutrients for our body to function normally. If I can extend this analogy a little bit further, imagine we have to understand that our body is an intelligent adaptive system. It is not like most systems, most machines, in the sense that if we took um, a simple clock or a computer or a bicycle or a car or, or a chair or anything like that, basically the more stress we subject it to, the, the faster that thing will break down. If I take my bicycle or my car and I drive it down a bumpy dirt road, the more I do that, the more it gets mud and water and sun and has to absorb bumps, the faster it's going to break down. The more stress it's exposed to, the, the, the more that it breaks. Okay, It's a very linear equation. More stress means more breakdown. Mm -hmm. Most people think of the human body in this way, but it doesn't actually work like this. The proper way of thinking about it is, imagine that you had a sports car. That's a magical sports car. It has a, it has a supernatural power where when you take this sports car out and you drive it hard and fast on you know, windy mountain roads, push it to its limits, crank that engine as fast as it can go, and then you go park your car in the garage overnight, you come back to your car the next day, and it grew a bigger, stronger engine and became more fuel efficient. And the tires developed more friction to grip the road better. And the car became more aerodynamic. And it, it learned, and the frame became stronger and the suspension learned to absorb the bumps better. Okay. And everything about that car became better and stronger as a result of being challenged and stressed. Okay. That is how the human body works. Stress these when it's biologically compatible stress makes us stronger okay and but the downside of of this magical ability that this sports car has is that if you leave it in the garage for two months and you don't challenge it you come back to it a couple months later and the wheels are falling off and the frame is rusting and that ferrari v8 engine shrank to a lawnmower engine and so on Okay, that's how the human body works. It's an intelligent, adaptive machine, not a simple machine. And because of that, because of that magical ability that's programmed into us, it, it, comes, it comes with that trade-off, okay? It has the ability to be resilient to, to not only survive stresses, but to actually be made stronger and healthier by them. But the, the downside is if you don't regularly challenge the system, the system grows weaker. Okay, so that, that's the context of, of how the human body needs, needs to be understood. Um, from there, we, we, we need to understand that there are many different ways that the human body can be challenged and grow stronger. So um, you asked me 
a minute ago. Remind me your question, David. So yeah, I, can I was make asking sure I... about like what the best strategies. What do we okay. need to do to strengthen so, the mitochondria? Okay, so the first thing that we need to understand and what you were talking about a minute ago with the dose is that the dose is going to be individual to the to the person. Okay, so if you have a lawnmower engine in your cells, you're going to have way less ca capacity to tolerate stress than um, somebody who has a Ferrari V8 engine in their cells. So first of all, to get the dose right, it needs to be individualized to a person's level, to a person's capacity. And the way we do that is very simple. Test your capacities in different ways, whether it's fasting, whether it's sauna, whether it's different types of exercise, whether it's breath holding practices. Test your, your capacities slowly and cautiously to find where your limits are. Okay, and you find that you brush up against discomfort, stop there the first few times, okay? You don't need to have some objective, you know, amount, oh, I'm supposed to be doing this amount of exercise, you know, this type of exercise for this many minutes per session, and I'm gonna go from zero <laughs> minutes of exercise right now to 45 minutes of this type of exercise starting tomorrow. No, start with five minutes, start with 10 minutes, start with however many minutes you can do before you feel a lot of discomfort. Let that be day one and you build on that. Next time, do slightly more, next time, do slightly more and so on. So that's the issue of dose. The other issue is biological compatibility. We need to understand that not all stress is created equal that cigarette smoking, the chemical stress from that or from environmental toxicants or from sleep deprivation or from chronic psychological stress or um, any other type of novel stress in the modern human environment is not the same as our ancestral stresses. Okay, so our ancestral stresses, we had certain things built into our life where we had to, we were exposed to periods without access to food, for example. We had to deal with famine and food shortage. We had to deal with lots of movement and exercise intensity, whether it's to hunt or to build or to fight or to run away from stuff. Um, we had to deal with heat and cold. We had to uh, occasionally deal with hypoxia at the tissue level, whether from activity or breath holding um, or other conditions, maybe being in a cave or things like that. Um, some groups of humans had underwater hunting strategies where that was more prominent. Um, we had to deal with exposure to phytochemicals in the foods that we were consuming and a number of other stressors. And those are the stressors that are specifically built in to our biology that we, we are designed over over thousands and thousands of generations of human beings, we, we evolved the capacity to handle, not only handle those stressors, but actually we evolved the biological capacity to adapt to them and grow stronger, be made stronger and healthier and more energetic and more disease resistant. This is why, you know, for 75 years, we have had modern medicine pursuing studying disease, studying the mechanisms of disease. And then based on this, trying to go to a chemistry lab and invent chemicals that are targeted to those mechanisms of disease with the idea that we're gonna have targeted chemicals that interrupt this mechanism of atherosclerosis or this mechanism of, you know, the, the serotonin levels, serotonin levels in the brain of depressed people, or we're gonna alter the formation of amyloid plaques and Alzheimer's disease. For 75 years, modern medicine has been doing that. We've invested trillions of dollars into that. And we've invented millions of potential drug candidates, 19,000 of which have been FDA approved and are in use. And out of those millions of drug candidates, trillions of dollars of money spent on hundreds of thousands of scientists pursuing this kind of model of human health, we don't have a single one that is anywhere close to as powerful in promoting health or preventing disease as simply moving your body vigorously for half an hour or getting into a sauna for half an hour, okay? And that 
if I can conceptualize it in a nutshell, that is the power of these kinds of strategies that I'm talking about. That is how essential they are to human biology uh, and human longevity.